All right. Uh, the audio didn't record, so I'm going to have to record the audio after the fact on this. Um, so I uh, just started up ANSYS 15 Workbench, and we are going to model a little spaceship and calculate drag and lift coefficients on it um, with applications typically for mainly for video games for people wanting realistic flight characteristics to their uh, spaceships or aircraft in video games. So in this workbench we're going to click on uh, fluid flow fluent we're going to click on it drag it over to the workspace and start a new fluent project um, right click on geometry go to new geometry and we're going to import a spaceship we made Alright, and I click on, after we import, I click on Generate. And it'll take a second, but it'll load. And there's our spaceship. And I just want to calculate a lift and drag coefficient for it. Um, in theory, you could, uh, in theory, you could calculate lift and drag coefficients at multiple angles of attack and, and kind of create a uh, drag polar for it. Um, we're just going to do just zero angle of attack in this for this example. But uh, again, you could create an entire drag polar for it if you wanted. So we are going to create a box to represent our fluid. Um, so we have two fields. Um, we have one that's kind of the start point of our box and one that's the size of our box. So what I like to do usually is, is size the box to about the size we want and then center it over the aircraft more or less. So you can kind of see, there you go. Um, so we change those dimensions, you can see our box um, changing depending on, on what we put in the number fields there. Uh, looks pretty good. Might want a little bit longer in terms of uh, wanting it to cover more of the aircraft. So we have plenty for the wake and, and plenty in front of it so any changes in the fluid in front of it uh, don't get lost. So, and then this is the part where we position it. So we're going to try and, and center it as, as best we can over the aircraft. We're actually only going to center it over half the aircraft. Because as it turns out, we can kind of use a shortcut where we only have to solve the fluid dynamics equations uh, over half the aircraft. And uh, so that cuts our computation time down it by half. So I've got pretty well centered over half the aircraft. So now, create the box. Now I'm just going to cut the shape of the aircraft out of the box. So <clears throat> I go to Boolean. And we're going to do want, want to do a subtraction Boolean. And the target body will be our fluid domain, the box, and our tool body will be the aircraft. And we rebuild, and there you go, you see a nice little indent where our aircraft used to be. That's exactly what we want to solve our, our fluids equations for. Um, now your aircraft, if you're modeling it in something like Blender, you can export as an STL and uh, bring it into something else like SolidWorks and then export as, a, as an IGS. Um, uh, so that can be a little bit tricky, but uh, 
other than that the the process is fairly straightforward um, I think this one I modeled directly in SolidWorks though so select the Like that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and create a mesh for it now. This takes a few seconds to load. Especially on our, our connection, this is being done over a remote connection. Uh, Ansys and Fluent are kind of expensive software packages, so actually going through a university. So there we go. We have our geometry. Um, and I'm going to name the different surfaces. This one's going to be named symmetry. It's going to be a symmetry layer and that's how we we cut our equations. We have to solve uh, our computation time down in half. We just assume that solving the equations on one half of the aircraft is going to be the same as the other. Um, so that's going to be our inlet where our air flows in and those are going to be our side outlets what's going to be our back outlet so now We can So let's see, from here, we can go ahead and select the whole thing. What I'm going to do is uh, just deselect. So this is our. our um, sizing function that we're adding to it. So I right clicked on mesh, uh, insert uh, sizing. So what I'm going to do, select the whole thing, I deselect using a box select, then I go just back to the normal single select option on the toolbar at the top. There's an option for the selection mode. And there we go. So now just the surfaces of the aircraft are selected. So I apply under geometry and under the element size, we're going to set that we are actually going to set that to Um, 0 0.25 I'm thinking it's a good number to start out with or 0 0.1 somewhere in that that region so now we look at our mesh and make sure the minimum size is not gonna constrain us it's not it says it's set to zero the other thing we're going to change that just generally helps uh, create the mesh a little bit better is so we're just going to use uh, tetrahedral elements. And uh, so I'm going to click update and it'll build the mesh. I'll probably pause and skip some of it so you don't have to wait and watch it build the whole thing. kind of tedious
All right, and uh, so it went ahead and built the entire mesh. You can see the elements are not too big, not too small. Captures the geometry okay of our ship. Uh, a little bit bigger further from the craft, smaller closer in. So that, that ought to solve nicely. And we haven't lost any detail really of our aircraft or spacecraft or whatever it is. So that should cover it for creating the mesh itself. Um, so now I think we're good to go on to um, I think we're good to go on to the actual setting up the solution. All right, so now we're setting things up. Just went to set up and All right. Um, so we're going to use the density based solver. Uh, we'll keep it at steady state and uh, we won't mess with any other settings. We'll use absolute pressure. Um, doesn't hurt to check your mesh. Um, just make sure you know we have the quality of some of our elements aren't that great, but. Uh, it, it shouldn't cause us too much problems uh, while while solving for it. So I'm going to turn on the under models. I'm going to turn on the energy equation, and under viscous, we're going to use k omega, and SST is the we're going to use SST K omega. Um, as far as air goes, we're going to change our density to ideal gas. So it's going to calculate based on pressure and temperature the density in each cell. And then viscosity, we'll go ahead and have that be calculated for the different cells as well in case there's some major temperature differences. We'll use a three coefficient Sutherland model. So click change and create and then close once we have it set the way we want. Um, we do want to change our operating conditions. And we're going to change our operating condition, our operating pressure uh, to zero actually. And for compressible flow problems, typically that just works better. And then you just solve, you just set your pressures at the boundaries. So we'll go to boundary conditions inlet. And we want to change it from a velocity inlet to a far field pressure inlet. So actually, yeah, we still need to change it. This is. Oh, did we change it? That yeah, looks like we did. So,
we went ahead and, and got that fixed up so we're good there should be anyway oh there we go pressure far field so yeah we'll just leave the gauge pressure well we'll set the gauge pressure to I think 15500 and we'll put the Mach number to I think we leave it close to 0 0.6 actually so we're assuming that it's kind of a high altitude you know uh, 40 50,000 feet ish um, if we're not sure on the properties you can always look them up online just google uh, air properties altitude and some of the first options that come up should give you nice little tables or things you can look up uh, air properties including density pressure viscosity temperature anything you could need i think it's one of them is particularly helpful um, so i'll change it to pressure far field I want to change our gauge pressure once again so inlets outlets we use far far field pressure uh, boundary conditions on all of them and that just it really works a lot better than uh, we need to set the temperature for that altitude as well i think i do that here compute from the inlet as far as the reference values that we're going to use um, that's usually the best way when you're doing an aerodynamic analysis and in terms of solution methods we're just going to use uh, Oh, you know what? I forgot to change the temperature. So I'm just going back, click on Edit, Thermal, and it lets you set the temperature on your boundary conditions as well. And you need to make sure all those match, otherwise you could get a discontinuity that causes it to diverge. Um, all right, so we're going to go with Gaussian Green Node-based. Um, or green gauze or whatever and then we're going to go second order on all our our other terms and that's usually pretty darn stable and, and it solves pretty well I haven't had good luck with supersonic flows but subsonic it works fine uh, current number we'll leave that at five sorry narrating after the fact I have to watch what I'm doing it's kind of hard to see uh, the the window resolution is a little bit lower while I'm recording audio so do the best I can so now we're adding uh, under monitors I clicked on create uh, drag and lift and we're also going to create a moment coefficient just so it's all there in case we need any of it um, so and i'm just plotting them i'm printing to console and as well as creating a plot for each of them so i can look at them over time and, and monitor how they're doing so next uh, we'll just do a standard initialization again from the inlet 
So that's just, just going to start out all the cells in the mesh with the properties that we've assigned at the inlet. So initialize it, uh, calculation activities, nothing special we need to do there. So I'm going to go ahead and throw in, we'll probably go 250 iterations at a time in case it uh, diverges or anything, which it might, and we'll solve. Um, so let that go for a second. And you can see it takes a few each time. I'll probably speed through this part. You can see it's plotting to the console though, so we can observe whether it's converging or not. You can see the different properties we can look at. For some reason it's not displaying our residuals correctly. Um, but I think the next time we start the calculation it, it plots them correctly that time. And it is converging. It does show it's converging. Whatever it is plotting there, it does show that it's converging. So we're actually in good shape. So I'll speed through this part. No need to watch the whole thing here. But as I mentioned, you can see it is converging um, quite nicely. Oh, there we go. We skipped through a bunch of that. So it is, as you can see, it shows that it's converging fairly well. Um, I'm just double checking my residual monitors because, like I mentioned, it didn't plot all of the residuals normally. I think it just plotted continuity. It didn't plot the others like it normally does. So... Overall, though, it looks pretty darn good. Um, our drag coefficient sort of converging. Our lift coefficient not really converging. It's still kind of all over the place. Uh, our moment coefficient really all over the place. And what it turns out we do to kind of fix this is we adapt our grid, uh, which I'll walk you through in a second. First, I'm just going to show you what it looks like, though. Uh, I go to graphics, I go to contours, and we want to look at contours of velocity and velocity magnitude. Um, I'm going to click on filled, and we'll just look at the symmetry surface. And I'll just kind of illustrate some of the things we can look at from Fluent. Uh, Post-processing has even more options for visualization, but it's not that necessary if you're just using it to spit out a number and, and get to throw it in a video game. So you can see the wake behind the aircraft. You can see the uh, velocity magnitude increases above and below the craft at points where it kind of bumps out, which is what happens on an airfoil normally. So that's that's good. It's doing what we expect it to do. Um, it probably just isn't refined well enough, like I said, and, and I think we uh, adapt our grid and, and refine the mesh a little bit so that we can kind of see uh, what it's supposed to look like number-wise and, and uh, coefficient-wise so we don't see this weird divergent behavior where it won't converge on a single value. Alright, and uh, yeah, reference values, if we want to look up any numbers or anything, reference values are important. Um, that's how they calculate the coefficients. All our coefficients are based off those reference values. So our characteristic area, our characteristic length, um, velocity, um, density for the aerodynamic equations. Kind of important. Um, let's 
So we're going to go to Adapt by Gradient. Um, we don't need a course on anything. We'll just uh, go to Velocity and refine it according to Velocity Magnitude. We want it to go off Gradient and uh, normalize. So I click on Compute. Gives me what values to go in between. Usually I just go 0.25 and that does pretty well. I mark those for refinement and I click on adapt if I'm okay with refining that number of cells. So we've refined a bunch of cells. We increased our number of elements and uh, we can go back to calculating. So I'll ask us if we want to save and use those changes for the future. And in this case we do. And you can see it kind of spikes, the residual spike when you start after you've refined your mesh and start solving again. Um, that's normal. They should fall back into where they were at fairly quickly fall back to about the same levels fairly quickly um, and went ahead and went through another 500 iterations and now um, we got behavior that shows it's starting to converge actually pretty well. So look at drag coefficient, it's starting to converge really well. I look at lift coefficient, it's starting to converge really well. And our even our moment coefficient is starting to oscillate less and less. So uh, refining the gradient um, really helped a lot in terms of getting us to numbers that, uh, getting things to stabilize and getting numbers uh, that are a little more, we can be a little more confident in. So again, I just kind of want to take a look at the symmetry surface of it. And if you look at it, you can see the wake starting to develop further. You still see the increases in velocity um, following the contours of, of the, the spacecraft or aircraft. Like I said, that's, that's normal. That's what happens to an airfoil as well. Um, so... That puts us in, in really good shape in terms of uh, we have a nice nice wake. It's starting to, to develop the back of the aircraft. Um, another thing we can look up under reports and forces, we can, we can manually spit out if we need the uh, force on the aircraft. Well, it's the force of half the aircraft, since that's all we're modeling, right? It doesn't know there's another half to it. Um, so it's the force. So double these when calculating, you know, when performing any calculations. Um, but we can use those to work backwards if we need to to get coefficients and terms that we're more comfortable with, like wing planform area or chord length, average chord length. Um, or, or whatever else uh, that we're not confident about in, in terms of uh, the aircraft. So that's another option we have for, for looking at the numbers. So um, 
really that uh, that's a, a good start at least for for uh, if you want to get realistic you know model your physics realistically for a video game um, in a video game you wouldn't do CFD in real time that would be way too expensive computationally but you can get lift and drag coefficients and moment coefficients from CFD and use those to, to get really fairly realistic aerodynamic models. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful and uh, I hope this uh, tutorial has uh, helped you learn a thing or two. Alright, I'm having trouble with my desktop recording software, but uh, we'll see if it uh, actually makes a video this time. Um, actually, it's, yeah, it looks like it's recording, so hopefully we got it this time. Um, so Fluent calculates its drag lift and, and its drag coefficient, lift coefficient, and moment coefficient a little different than, than you do in typical aerodynamics. The equation looks identical, but the terms come from elsewhere. Um, so drag is going to be equal to one half times the uh, characteristic density, usually the upstream air density, times the characteristic velocity, which is usually the upstream velocity, times the characteristic area, um, times the drag coefficient. So that's how they define the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient is just this. Well, sorry, the drag coefficient is the drag force divided by all this other stuff. That's, so anytime you see that in Fluent, that's where, this is where they're getting it from. Uh, lift coefficient, basically the same thing, lift force and, and coefficient. Same thing, only it's the lift force and the lift coefficient. Uh, the aircraft moment, same thing, only uh, moment coefficient and the moment of the aircraft and in order to get it from a force to a moment, you have to multiply by an additional length factor, which they usually just use a characteristic length. Where do they get those characteristic values from? Well, if you look up your reference values, usually you want to compute your reference values before you start from the uh, inlet, wherever your inlet is. Um, that's usually the best way to go about it. And then, um, and then that way, uh, after the fact, you go to look it up, you know, where, where your numbers came from and things. Um, so characteristic area is that top one. Characteristic density, second one. Characteristic length, uh, that one. And characteristic velocity is that one. Um, in aerodynamics, you might hear this this. Uh, referred to this one half times density times velocity squared. You might hear that referred to as the uh, dynamic pressure. Um, it uh, commonly comes up when calculating things like drag and lift and, and moments. So, um, yeah, speaking of typical aerodynamics, uh, here's how they typically look at, at things. Um, Everything's the same. Uh, they all use upstream values, so upstream air density, upstream air velocity um, squared, times the wing planform area, which is just the span of the wings, times the average chord of the wings, span being the dimension of the wings perpendicular to the flow, um, and uh, average chord being the, the average dimension of the wings in the direction of the flow, uh, parallel to the flow. Um, and then again, uh, using then multiplied by the, the drag coefficient or the lift coefficient, depending on which one you're calculating. The aircraft moment, or at least the moment created by the wings of the aircraft, is going to be the same, only using the moment coefficient, <clears throat> and then using as our characteristic length the average chord length. All right, so in two dimensions. Um, these are, are basically the forces we have working on an aircraft. We have our thrust going in the direction of the aircraft, drag going the opposite, lift perpendicular to both of those, and weight going straight down always. Um, so doing some trig, we can calculate uh, the acceleration based on the forces. Um, we can then use the acceleration to calculate the change in velocity 
over a given timestamp. We can then use the uh, velocity and the acceleration at a given time and knowing what the time step is to calculate a change in, in distance over a given time step. Um, and then same thing with the y, um, same thing with the y direction. Um, again, just using uh, all of uh, all the forces, using some trig to get all the forces uh, to calculate um, the acceleration in the y direction. So, uh, yeah, basically the same thing there. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So, um, let's see. So in three dimensions, it gets a little more complicated. Um, we define a few angles. Uh, one angle, uh, the uh, kind of the pitch, the the um, what the angle is with the horizontal that the plane makes. Um, we also define uh, kind of a rotation, what what direction, you know, northeast, west, northeast, southwest, whatever. Uh, whatever direction the aircraft's pointing, uh, that's determined by this angle phi. Uh, we'll call that one theta. And then any, uh, if the airplane, if the wings of the airplane aren't level and they're tilted slightly, then we'll call that gamma. And that changes what direction some of our fundamental forces are acting in. So, using some uh, more complicated trigonometry this time, we come up with. Um, we can come up again with the acceleration, the change in velocity, um, the, and then use the velocity and acceleration to find the change in, in uh, the displacement in whatever x, y, or z direction we're looking in. Um, so let's go back a couple pages. Um, so lift, drag, and actually the moment coefficient are going to be functions of the angle of attack of the wing. Um, so what direction uh, the flow is, is uh, hitting the wing with. And there will also be a function of the Reynolds number. Um, angle of the attack of the wing we change by have, putting ailerons and elevators on them. Um, well, wings are airfoils. and. Uh, Basically, when we change the position of a, a flap on a wing, we're changing its angle of attack, which will change its lift coefficient, its drag coefficient, and its moment coefficient. Um, Reynolds number is just basically uh, depends on the, the physics of the environment. Um, the density of the fluid times the velocity of the fluid uh, divided by the viscosity of the fluid and then uh, multiply by some characteristic length. Usually we use the average cord length. Um, if we're analyzing just an airfoil, for sure it's the cord length. If we're analyzing a whole plane, that can be a cord length or some other uh, length. Um, speed through this. Uh, usually we look at lift as a function primarily of, of angle of attack. It is also a function of Reynolds numbers, so uh, you might want to factor that in as well. But uh, so typically, yeah, we, we look at it in terms of uh, angle of attack, and as our angle of attack changes, our lift coefficient changes. Well, as our lift coefficient changes, our drag coefficient changes. So typically, typically we look at drag coefficient as a function of lift coefficient. Um, if you're just doing uh, just kind of a, a fun video game that you want to have realistic flight physics but you're not going for perfection, um, you could represent the drag polar, as they call it, as uh, probably just a simple quadratic equation or maybe a quartic equation, just as long as it has this basic shape to it. And you won't be missing out too much on, on the physics. Um, if you're if you're gonna be realistic, you'll want to get a ton of data points. But otherwise, I'd say uh, four or five data points would be plenty to to get a drag puller for a given vehicle at a given Reynolds number. 
So, uh... Well, that basically covers it. Hopefully you found this uh, brief video tutorial helpful, and it'll help you on your uh, video game project or physics or engineering or whatever you're using it for.